Hi everyone, welcome to another PS Platypus recording. Today we're going to be doing the lecture on acid-base balance and compensation mechanisms. I'm so glad you're here because this is one of my favorite topics. It's also one of those topics that gets a really bad rap because it can get quite complicated if you don't try and simplify these topics beforehand. But that's the aim of today, is to try and make this as fun as possible with as many case studies and questions as I possibly can fit in, as well as to make it a little bit more fun by simplifying the like the millions of formulas that they tell you to remember down to just some simple principles that you can apply um, very, very easily, even at the bedside if you require in the future. So without any further ado, let's begin. Uh, in a similar way to the way that I've run some of the other physiology lectures, I just want to start off with some basic principles that you may be familiar with from first year, but if not, that's totally fine because we're going to be going over it again. So what is the normal physiological pH within our body? Uh, within our body? The main difference between physiological pH that is normal versus a neutral pH is that neutral pH, um, if you remember back to chemistry, if you remember that far back, is it's the pH at which your um, HCO3 minus ions balances out with your H plus ions. So that tends to happen at about 6.8, or you could say around seven at 37 degrees Celsius. The normal physiological body pH is actually not the same as 6.8. It is around 7.4 for a number of reasons, which we'll not go over, but it's really important to understand that that's the difference. The range is actually somewhere between 7.36 and 7.44, just for your interest. But when we do calculations, 7.4 is um, going to suffice. Now, when we actually try and use some maths, so we know the relationship between pH and um, hydrogen ions, we know that the pH of 7.4 corresponds to a hydrogen ion concentration of about 40 nanomolars. Now, why is that important? Well, 40 nanomolars is not a lot, which means that we now have an idea that this hydrogen ion concentration needs to be maintained within a very, 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 very small scale. And if we have even tiny changes within pH, that results in quite a drastic change to our H plus concentration, which is not good. And we can give some terms to what those uh, pathological changes could be. So if you have a pH that is a lot lower than 7.4, um, in other words, it's becoming more acidic, we call it acidosis or acidemia. Generally speaking, acidemia is the actual change in the pH, whereas acidosis is the, um, the pathology that actually arises from the acidemia, if that makes sense. If you have a pH that's greater than 7.4, that's called alkalemia, and what comes out of that is alkalosis. So a patient, you could say, is an acidosis, they're acidotic, or you can say that they're an alkalosis, they're alkalotic. There's also a couple of other parameters that are really important to know. And it might not seem like it now, but these are all relevant to acid-base balance. So we already have pH. We know it's 7.36, 7.44. The average is about 7.4, which we'll use for our calculations. CO2, so in this case, it's PCO2, the, so the actual pressure of carbon dioxide within our blood. That ranges from 36 to 44 millimeters of mercury, or on average, you can just say it's 40 millimeters of mercury. And finally, the bicarb concentration within our blood sits at between 22 and 26 uh, millimolars. And again, the average of that we can say is 24 millimolars. So if we can uh, remember these numbers for the calculations that we're gonna do in the next couple of slides, that'd be awesome. Or you can keep this as reference until you can remember it yourself. Because I think that in the exam, they won't give you these numbers, which is why it's super important that you, you know it off the top of your head as best as possible. Now, how do we actually maintain this pH? Because as I said, if it goes too high by a little bit or too low by a little bit, that is not good for your body. Well, one really simple way to think about it is that we can excrete any excessive acids that we have to maintain this normal pH. This is assuming that we're in an acidotic state. So we have way too much acid. Um, in the next couple of slides, I'll go over some more general cases, but I believe you just had a lecture on this by itself. So here we go. If you have volatile acids, in other words, these we know acid means H plus donating, but volatile means that it's a gaseous form. So generally speaking, that's going to be your CO2 produced um, by cells. And this sits at about 15,000 millimolars per day, which is a huge, huge burden of CO2 within your body. And the way that this CO2 reacts within your system is via this equilibrium reaction. So CO2 plus H2O produces H2CO3, and then that produces H plus and then HCO3. Hence why CO2 actually leads to acidosis because it generates H plus in the very end. So the way that you can get rid of this acid is by breathing out that excessive volatile CO2, and that'll shift the equilibrium towards the CO2 side, which means you have less H plus 
Now, this is clinically relevant for a couple of reasons. And I think these are gone over in your, in your slides, in your lecture. But the two really important ones just to keep in mind is general anesthetic. So if you've got someone under general anesthetic, they're not going to be able to breathe in and out as they normally do um, without any supplemental support. So what will end up happening is they're not going to be able to breathe out the CO2. Their body will slowly become more acidotic, which is not good, right? So we need to make sure that they have some sort of airflow happening, uh, which we always do in surgery, for example. Also in COPD, because these um, patients already have a very, very reduced capacity to exchange oxygen with the surroundings or exchange CO2 with the surroundings, we recommend that they go into a low carb diet because carbs are the number one food that tends to generate a lot of CO2, which would increase acid um, production in their body, which they already have a high amount of in COPD. So that's not good as well. Non-volatile acids, so in other words, acids that um, are fixed or they're metabolic, so they can't just be breathed away, that tends to be produced from protein uh, metabolism. And on a daily basis, that's about 70 millimolar. So not as much as the volatile acids, but still a considerable amount. So the way that this re reacts is that you've got your proteins. So A represents proteins. So you can say HA, because that's a protein that has a hydrogen ion on it, reacts with HCO3 minus and that liberates the protein away. So you've got A minus, that's the anion. You end up with H2O, you end up with CO2. So in other words, the acid that you started off with gets buffered by the bicarb in order to make CO2. And so that's how you end up with CO2 from your protein. This acid can then be excreted away by the kidneys um, so that you don't end up with a huge amount of acid, like fixed acid within your body. So this diagram over here on the right kind of sums some of this stuff up really nicely. It's more about the volatile acids just because they're a bit more important. But you can also imagine a similar diagram would exist for your non-volatile acid uh, metabolism. So what are the normal mechanisms that allow us to actually maintain a good acid-base balance? So now we're going to be a bit more general rather than just thinking about an acidotic state. How do we, in general, make sure that things don't become too acidic or too basic? Well, you've got three main mechanisms. The first one, and the one that acts uh, like immediately, instantly, is the buffer system. So when you have a massive swing in your pH for whatever reason, which we'll go over in a couple of slides time, uh, this is the system that is gonna kick in. It's the first line, it's very nonspecific, kind of like when we talk about first line immunity. So because CO2 is a very, very lipid soluble molecule, as you know, even the slightest change in pCO2 can really quickly change your H plus, which is why we need a buffer system that is super duper rapid. Now the buffer systems that exist will depend on the compartment. So if you look at the extracellular compartment, you have the carbonic acid bicarb system. Intracellularly, you tend to have the phosphate buffer system. And then across both of them, you can have protein buffers, including hemoglobin, amino acids, plasma proteins. None of this is stuff you need to remember, but it's just interesting to see the variety of systems that you have in order to ensure that any rapid changes are dealt with as fast as possible. Now, for the most part, you know, like every day, your pH is gonna change. It's not always gonna be a constant 7.4 which is why having a buffer system like this, which is really discrete, is super awesome. But then think about situations where the buffer system is gonna get overwhelmed. So, so say for example, you've got a chronic condition where the buffer system has tried and tried and tried, but it can't um, possibly bring the pH back to normal. Well, in that case, you're gonna have to bring in another system, which we've already had a talk about already, which is ventilation. So this is also quite rapid. It's a reflex response and it deals with about 75% of the imbalance. So it's pretty good. It ensures that the rate of excretion of CO2 via breathing matches the rate of production within your body, which keeps your blood levels at a stable value. It occurs by changes with alveolar ventilation. So if you have increased alveolar ventilation, in other words, breathe in, breathe out more, it removes more of that CO2 because you're breathing it out. If you have decreased alveolar ventilation, you tend to retain more of that CO2 because you're not breathing it out anymore. Now it all sounds really good, but the effect effectiveness of this particular system is not that great. So it's still 50 to 75%. But the bad thing is that it's a, because it's a very rapid response, you know, like three to 12 minutes, that's pretty good. But it can't cope if the cause is non-respiratory, which makes sense. Like if you have a problem with your kidneys, yes, the system will still kick in, but it takes a lot longer than if you actually have a respiratory condition. But the more important thing is, that because in some conditions you have a chronically high um, acidity, and remember that the way that your body determines acidity is generally by looking at your CO2 levels. If you have a really, really high acidity, then your chemoreceptors start to think, oh, I've looked at this pCO2 for so long. Um, it's not changing no matter how much I look at it. So I'm going to now switch to looking at something else, which might give me a better indication. And that's maybe something I can rely on more, which is oxygen levels, 
Now, while this might seem like a good move from your body, because obviously PCO2 wasn't working for it, it's not that great for this system because this system relied on getting rid of CO2. Whereas now because your body is looking at O2, it makes this system pretty useless. Now it's not going to work. So in a chronic setting, in other words, you know, this system is really, really good, but in a chronic setting, it's not able to really cope. So what actually kicks in during a chronic setting, that would be your kidneys. So it's still, it's quite slow compared to your um, respiratory system, which takes, we said it takes about um, three to 12 minutes. In this case, it takes about 48 hours to kick in. So two days, but it has a greater capacity to actually correct an imbalance um, with a bit more potency. And the way it does this, we've gone over this already, so I'm not gonna go into it in a huge amount of detail, but it does this via H plus excretion or resorption of HCO3 or vice versa. And it relies on a couple of internal buffers. So we talked about bicarb, ammonia, and phos uh, phosphate in your kidney lectures. Now, a couple of disease states just to be familiar with. In diabetic ketoacidosis, DKA, when you have an increase in your acidity, the buffers in your kidney will start to upregulate in order to, um, I guess, titrate that H plus away. It's mainly ammonia that increases, but all of them will in some form. Uh, and this will allow X, uh, H plus to be excreted out via the urine. However, say, for example, you have a chronic renal failure patient. So obviously their kidneys have failed, so they're not going to be able to create the buffer system because they've lost so many nephrons that now this H plus will not be able to be excreted no matter how much they try. So if you look at the table on the right, you can see in a DKA patient, they've got a huge amount of H plus, which is to be expected because of the um, ketoacidosis, but they're still able to excrete a huge amount of that H plus because they still have an upregulation of the ammonia, which is the buffer. However, in chronic renal failure, yes, while they're not gonna have a huge amount of increased H plus because there's no reason for it to be higher, they're not gonna be able to actually titrate away any of that or like a, a huge amount of that, right? Compared to 20 normally, only 10 of that, so half of it is actually gonna be titrated away. That's because if you have a look at the ammonia, that hasn't increased a lot because your kidney is failing. It's not gonna be able to produce it anymore. Now, when it comes to clinical settings, I want to, like, if I see a patient and I've looked at their blood results and I've looked at their pH, I want to be able to really quickly figure out what sort of state they're in. And the way that we do that is using this flow chart, for example, or have this in your mind somewhere. So firstly, you look at a patient's pH. If it's less than 7.36, or in this case, it's saying 7.35, either one is fine. If it's less than that, they're going to be acidic or acidotic. When you have a high pH of about 7.46 or 7.45 or 7.44, whatever you say, they're going to be alkalotic. I want to be a bit more specific, though, because this tells me that there is the problem. It's either acidosis or alkalosis. But what is actually causing the problem? Why are they in acidosis? Why are they in alkalosis? To do that, we have to look at their CO2 and bicarb levels. So if they're acidotic, the only reason that can happen is if their CO2 is high because we know that CO2 produces a, a bunch of H plus in our blood or our bicarb levels are low because bicarb is the alkalotic sort of substance, right? It's a thing, it's a base, it balances out your acids. So either you have CO2 high or HCO3 low. In the same way, alkalotic, in an alkalotic patient on the right, you either have a low amount of CO2, which is not generating enough H plus, or you have way too much bicarb in your blood. So in other words, it's just, it's, it's a, like a huge amount of base in your blood and you don't have a huge amount of acid. So it's one of two reasons. Now, if the change is to in CO2, you call it respiratory, whatever. And if the change is in a HCO3, you call it metabolic. So for example, if I have a patient who is acidotic, um, so their pH is much, let's say it's like seven, that's really bad. Obviously, I don't think they would survive for that long, but let's say it's seven and the CO2 is really, really high. So that's the problem. We know then that's going to be called respiratory acidosis. So the far left. In another situation, if I have a patient who has a very, very high pH, like eight, which again, wouldn't really be possible, but let's say it was, and the HCO3 is super high. So we now know that's the reason why they're alkalotic. We would call it metabolic alkalosis. Okay, so it's really important to understand these terms because we're going to be using it a huge amount when we get to our questions. So, these next two slides, you know, they're there more for your interest. And I think it's been covered in a module somewhere on your, um, in your workshops or your lectures. I don't think it's overly important. I've, I've highlighted a couple of things, which I think might be useful to know for your exams, but there are like a lot of causes for each of these conditions. So let's start with the respiratory causes. So you've got respiratory acidosis and alkalosis. I put the measurements there for your interest as well. So you remember what its definition is. The 
uh, thing to remember is that when you look at respiratory causes, you've got acute and chronic uh, versions. And the reason why we have that is because when you have a respiratory condition, we'll go over this later, so don't get too confused at this stage. When you have a respiratory condition, you tend to have a metabolic compensation. And metabolic things take, as we know, if you look at the kidneys, it took 48 hours. So you will have an acute response and then you'll have a chronic response. In a similar way, you will have an acute versus a chronic respiratory alkalosis. Again, I don't want you to get confused at this stage. We will go over it in a few slides time. But you've got acute versus chronic. That's the main thing. In respiratory acidosis, you have an acute, uh, you have acute respiratory acidosis for a number of reasons. The main ones to remember are uh, CNS depression. So with opioid um, analgesics, for example. And in chronic respiratory acidosis, it's generally due to an obstructive or restrictive lung disorder. For example, asthma, fibrosis, pneumonia, that kind of thing which will lead to hypoxia and hypercapnia. So low oxygen, high CO2. In respiratory alkalosis, um, not as common, or at least there's not that many conditions or things to remember. In acute respiratory alkalosis, what can happen is over-enthusiastic mechanical ventilation. In other words, hyperventilating, either on purpose or because of some pathological process. So what you're doing is you're getting rid of a lot of CO2, which leads your pH to go way too high. In chronic respiratory alkalosis, not very common, but it can still be very serious. So in anxiety, you can get it. If you have a head injury that um, damages part of your brain, you can get it. In aspirin overdose, it's possible. And also it's possible in pneumonia. So again, not really that important to remember these ones, but it's still a good idea to know, like generally speaking, what can cause what. The more important ones are the metabolic acidosis and the metabolic alkalosis. So again, the definitions are there for you. Um, I'm going to start off with the right-hand side because the left-hand side requires um, a couple of definitions. So metabolic alkalosis, there are four main systems that it can be caused by. Gastrointestinal cause can be a loss of stomach um, H+. And the main way that happens is vomiting because your um, stomach acid contains HCl. So H+, is there. You're just vomiting it all out so that you will get alkalosis. And some reasons you can get vomiting are because of pyloric stenosis. Or if you have nasogastric uh, drainage, you can aspirate some of that acid out, which means you're not going to have any H plus there. In terms of renal causes, it can be due to acute loss of plasma H plus. So classic iatrogenic way you can do it is via thiazide and loop diuretics, which leads to hypovolemia. And you suddenly have lost a lot of that H plus that is being filtered away because it promotes the resorption and uh, resorption of sodium and therefore excretion of H plus. Medications, for some reason, antacids and laxatives can do it. And in, in terms of endocrine, again, for some reason, Cushing's and um, androgen or hyperandrogenism can actually lead to metabolic alkalosis. Now, when it comes to metabolic acidosis, before I go into the reasons, I just want to cover these terms first. So HAGMA and NAGMA, what do they mean? Well, in the next slide, I go into a couple of um, details about that. So the, if you look at the terms, um, they are both end in MA. So MA is metabolic acidosis, so that part is easy. The AG, so AGMA, that's um, anion gap. Anion gap, metabolic acidosis. H means high and N means normal. So high anion gap metabolic acidosis is HAGMA and normal anion gap metabolic acidosis is NAGMA. So what does that mean? Well, the anion gap is this nifty formula here. So you look at your patient's blood values and you take their sodium levels and you subtract away the Cl minus and the HCO3 minus levels. In other words, you're just looking at the difference between the major important cation in the body, which is sodium, and then you're uh, finding the difference between that and the major important anions in the body, which are mainly Cl minus and HCO, HCO3 minus. Now, of course, these are not the, the only anions and cations that are present. If anything, you know, sodium is probably like, that one makes sense because you tend to have a lot of sodium in your body. So that kind of is the most important cation, but Cl minus and HCO3 minus, the most important in the sense that you've got a lot of them. You've still got a lot of smaller, minor, but still um, like when you combine them all together, they still produce a lot of substance, if that makes sense. So if you take the total amount of um, cations minus away the total amount of anions that are important, then you end up with a, a measure that actually is the amount of unmeasured um, anions. They're way too minor to actually measure, for example, proteins, SO4 to minus, but they're still there. And this allows us to calculate how much of those unmeasured anions there actually are. So generally speaking, and again, this number changes quite a bit across different sources, but the one that I found to be most consistent is 12 
millimolar plus or minus four. Okay. Some sources say 16 plus or minus four. Some even go as far as to say like 14 plus or minus eight. So a huge uh, variety, but they all depend on like a lot of different things, like the amount of plasma proteins you have, et cetera. But again, for our purposes, let's use 12 plus or minus four. So this diagram here is a really nice illustration of that. So you've got your normal anion gap, which is your balance between sodium. Then you've got Cl minus, HCO3 minus. The remaining anions that we didn't really bother to look at is constituting that pink box. And that should be about 12 plus or minus four. Or as it says in this diagram here, nine to 14, which is, uh, it's a bit more difficult actually. It's like 11.5 plus or minus 2.5, which is obviously more difficult to remember. You've also got increased anion gap. And the reason why that can happen is that you still got the same amount of Na plus, you still got the same amount of uh, Cl minus. What happens is that you've got a fall in HCO3 and you are gonna have two uh, compensatory mechanisms. So either when you have a fall in HCO3, the number of unmeasured anions increases to compensate, which is known as the increased anion gap or high anion gap metabolic acidosis. Or what can happen is the HCO3 reduces the anion gap stays the same, but Cl minus picks up the slack. So that increases. And so essentially, yes, you've got increased chlorides, but the anion gap hasn't changed. So we call it normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. Hopefully that makes sense. So basically what's happening is HCO3 has gone down. Either the pink box can become bigger or the Cl minus box can become bigger to um, take all the slack and match up still with the Na plus because everything must be electro neutral at the very end, okay? Another term for NAGMA, so normal anion gap metabolic acidosis, is I think hypochloremic metabolic acidosis or something, which is obviously a bit more useful because it tells us we've got a lot of chlorine. But regardless, the nomenclature that's used most is NAGMA and HAGMA. Now, it's very useful because it tells us if we have a HAGMA, we've got a set of things that it could be. And if it's a NAGMA, it's another set of things that it could be. So if I go back, if you look at HAGMA, high anion gap metabolic acidosis, one mnemonic you can use, which is really simple, is LTKR. So, um, I think one sentence that they use is left total knee replacement. So I'll take TKR to remember that. It's lactates, toxins, ketones, and renal failure. In other words, things that will lead to an increase in acid within your blood. If you want to go into a bit more detail, you can use the mnemonic mule pack. I don't think you need to go into this much detail, but it gives you a few more things to think about. So methanol or ethanols, in other words, you uh, like alcohol. Uremia, which relates to that renal failure thing we talked about. Uh, the uremic acid, lactic acidosis, so lactate from the previous one, ethylene glycol, peraldehyde, aspirin toxicity, as well as ketones, another really important one from when you're starved or whether you are um, a diabetic patient. So really, I think the LTKR, LTKR covers the most important ones. Mule pack just adds a couple more niche ones in there for fun. In terms of NAGMA, so normal anion gap acidosis, the mnemonic here is CAGE. So think about things firstly, the most obvious one is things that increase chloride because we know that in NAGMA, you get an increase in chlorine. So you can have ingestion of chlorine. So really, really salty food, for example, you can even have salt pills or saline infusions. Another one is Addison's disease. So you have less renal HCO3 being resorbed and your body has to increase Cl minus to compensate. Gastrointestinal one, this is super important. So the most common cause of NAGMA in any patient is gonna be diarrhea. And then E is just for extra, it's like a catch-all. The most important one here is renal tubular acidosis, so loss of the tubules, and essentially it does the same thing as Addison's. You just get less of that HCO3 back. So the reason why I've underlined diarrhea and vomiting across the metabolic acidosis and metabolic alkalosis is because those are the only ones that I've seen where you really need to know which one it causes. The easiest way to remember is vomit contains stomach acid. Stomach acid is acidic. So if you lose it, you're going to become alkalotic. Diarrhea is the opposite. So that's going to cause acidosis. Just remember those two, you'll be fine. And if you're going to remember something extra for fun, just remember LTKR because that can come up as well. So we've covered this and iron gap. Now we come to the actual bedside rules or ways to actually figure out what a patient is going through in an exact moment when you get given their bloods. So before we even go into the calculations, let's remember these two really important rules. Firstly, if you've got a metabolic disturbance, so a metabolic cause behind the acid-base um, imbalance, it will always lead to a respiratory compensatory mechanism or vice versa. And so a really good example is like if you have respiratory acidosis, well, the reason why you have respiratory acidosis is probably because your lungs are not doing their function properly. 
So now another system, in this case, your kidneys will need to kick in to be able to reduce the acidic load, okay? Another rule is that the compensation must always be in the same direction as the primary disturbance. Now this sounds really confusing, it's very, very simple. If you have a look at the diagram on the right, let's say you have metabolic acidosis, or actually let's focus on respiratory acidosis from the previous example. The reason why you have that is because you've got a huge amount of CO2. Again, because your lungs aren't functioning properly, it's not breathing it out, which is why you retain a lot of CO2 acidosis. So what has to happen is that your HCO3 minus has to come up because HCO3 minus is basic, right? It's gonna balance out the acid. And when, it's, when I say the rule is in the same direction, essentially you can see both the arrows go up, right? If PCO2 went up, HCO3 has to go up. In metabolic acidosis, HCO3 went down, so PCO2 also has to come down. Now you can think about it like logically, like in the way that I talked through it before, or you can just think about it like this. Uh, if both of them go up, they have to, if both of them go down, they have to, okay? In other words, respiratory acidosis must be corrected by some form of metabolic alkalosis, if you wanna think about it like that. So to switch everything around, you need to have some form of metabolic alkalosis to correct what we had before, okay? So let's put it into practice with a couple of formulas. So these are the bedside, I think they're called Boston rules or something like that. Um, I think they have a lot of names because they've been changed um, across time, but it's an easy way to assess whether someone's body is actually compensating well or not. So let's say that you've got a primary respiratory disorder. In other words, your lungs aren't functioning properly or something's happened there, and you've got either respiratory acidosis or respiratory alkalosis. In this case, we need a metabolic compensation to happen. And the way that we measure if that metabolic compensation has happened is we look at has the HCO3 minus actually changed to compensate, right? Because what happened is CO2 is too high, CO2 is too low. We need HCO3 to change to compensate for that. And the expected amount of HCO3 you would need to see if they had adequately compensated is given via this formula. So 24 plus or minus, uh, I put X there because I'm a max minded person and I'll go over what that means later. X um, and then in brackets, it's multiplied by uh, delta PCO2 divided by 10. So let's just break that down a little bit. So the X I'm gonna go over in a little bit of time, but the delta PCO2 is the difference between your normal PCO2, the one that you would expect to see in everyone's blood and the PCO2 that this patient has in this moment. Okay, so let's go over what that X means now. If you have, uh, oh, actually I'll explain. So the reason why I put X there is because all these formulas that I'm gonna go over have the exact same format. It's just that the numbers change a little bit. So if you have an acute respiratory acidosis, it becomes 24 plus one times everything else. If it's acute alkalosis, 24 minus two times whatever else. Chronic acidosis is 24 plus, again, four times something. Chronic alkalosis is 24 minus five times something. So you can notice a pattern, right? In the acute setting, you have low numbers. So you just got one and two. So acidosis is one, alkalosis is two. Anytime you have an acidosis, that symbol is a plus. And if it's alkalosis, the symbol is a minus. And then a similar thing for chronic acidosis and chronic alkalosis. This time the numbers are bigger. So it's four and five. Same thing though, acidosis is a plus, alkalosis is a minus. Okay, so that's important to remember. With primary metabolic disorders, it's a little bit simpler. So you need to have some sort of respiratory comp uh, compensation. So in other words, because HCO3 minus is too high or too low, CO2 needs to cut, uh, needs to do something, right? To be able to correct that or at least balance it. So the expected change in PCO2 is gonna be X, so some number times the, uh, the concentration of HCO3 in their blood plus another number. And again, as I mentioned before, you don't have anything like acute or chronic versions because the compensation that you get, which is respiratory, happens within three to 12 minutes, right? So it's all pretty much acute. So then acidosis, those numbers are 1.5 times um, concentration of HCO3 plus eight. And in alkalosis, it's 0 0.7 times concentration of HCO3 plus 20. Now the added thing with uh, acidosis and alkalosis in a metabolic uh, syndrome is that you also have these tolerance ranges. And I'm not sure why, I think it's just because it's not as reliable. So with acidosis, just have a leeway of about plus or minus two. And alkalosis have a leeway of about plus or minus five. Now. Why is this important? If you actually look at the bloods and the values for the patient are very different to what the expected value should be for a good compensation, then we say that the patient has inadequate compensation. In other words, either their body hasn't had enough time to actually correct that, I guess the change or the damage that happened, or 
in a worse situation, their body just doesn't have the capacity to fight whatever has happened. And that can be because, for example, if you've got a respiratory problem, then maybe the kidneys are also like the kidneys are not functioning. Like maybe this is a really old person and the kidneys are not doing so well. They're not going to be able to compensate via that mechanism. So they will have inadequate compensation as well. So it's really important and useful to know at what stage are we with this patient, as well as looking at some of the other clinical context things that are happening around this patient's history, examination findings, et cetera, to help us bring all this information together. So let's just do that. Let's try and actually put this all together into a couple of interesting cases. So in this example case, we've got a patient who has a pH of 7.1, PCO2 of 60 millimeters of mercury, and a HCO3 minus of 31 millimolars after an acute pneumothorax. Do these blood results show adequate acid-based compensation or not? So there's a couple of really easy steps to be able to answer any question that asks you this specific thing. Is there adequate compensation or not? Step one, what acid-base imbalance do they have in the first place? So what is the primary thing that's happening in this person? So let's have a look at this diagram. Again, we're looking at, is it acidosis or alkalosis? So that requires pH. pH is 7.1, which is quite low. So we know that it's already on the left-hand side. It's an acidosis. Now we look at CO2 and HCO3. Remember, the only way you can have acidosis if it is if CO2 is very high or if HCO3 is way too low. In this case, if you look at PCO2, it's 60, which is way higher than the normal range that it should be, right? And again, look back at your reference values from the first slide. That'll tell you that 60 is way, way, way too high, okay? Remember that PCO2 is somewhere between 36 and 44. So now we know that this is a respiratory acidosis, okay? So that's the important thing. So let's circle that for ourselves. We know this is, patient is in respiratory acidosis. The question is, is their body actually doing anything about it? Or is it still going to take some time to be able to get there? Or do they need some extra support? Step two. So what needs to happen? Well, we know it's respiratory acidosis. So we need some form of metabolic alkalosis to correct this. So metabolic compensation. And how do we do that? Well, it needs to go in the same direction, right? We've got way too high CO2. So we need to also increase HCO3 to balance that out. So we need to increase HCO3. That's the compensation that needs to happen. Now let's apply a formula. So we know that this patient is in acute respiratory acidosis. Why did I pick acute? Well, we know that the patient has acute pneumothorax. So it's unlikely to be a chronic setting that this patient is in. So acute respiratory acidosis. I mean, if we kind of go back very quickly to the formulas, acute acidosis is 24 plus one times um, the difference between PCO2 for normal versus this patient divided by 10. So now if I go back, what I've done is I've plugged in those values. So 24 plus one times, which I haven't included there because it's just one times the number, 60 minus 40, because we know 60 is what this patient has. 40 is sort of the normal value and you divide it by 10. So 24 plus 60 minus 40 divided by 10, that gives us 26 millimeters of mercury. Um, sorry, no, 26 millimolars because we're talking about HCO3 minus concentration. So let's put this all together. We had a patient with a respiratory acidosis. We need them to increase their HCO3 because that's the only way they're going to correct the acidosis. However, if you look at their, um, if you look at the formula, we need for there to be at least 26 millimolars of HCO3 for us to say, okay, this patient has compensated. How much do they actually have though? Well, if you have a look at their bloods again, they've got 31, which means they're way past that threshold. So that means that they have adequately compensated. In fact, they've sort of overshot it, right? Which means, I mean, in this case, it's probably a good thing because they need to be able to correct it as quickly as possible. So we say, since the patient's HCO3 is actually higher, they are adequately compensated. Good news. Let's look at another case. A patient with severe vomiting has a pH of 7.6, PCO2 of 30, um, and HCO3 of 30 as well. Do these blood results show adequate acid-base compensation or not? Now, automatically, when you see vomiting, what are you thinking? What does this patient have? So they've, they're vomiting, they're getting rid of a lot of HCL. We're thinking they have some sort of metabolic alkalosis, right? And let's see if that's the truth, right? Because we don't want to assume. Let's actually look at their pH and all the other stuff that comes with it. So step one, what is the imbalance? Have a look at this table again. Your pH is 7.6. That is very high. So it's an alkalosis. So we're looking at the blue side. Now, is it because the CO2 is too low or is it because the HCO3 is too high? Well, if you have a look at the HCO3, that's 30, right? 30 is too high. Okay, so the normal, if you look at the normal HCO3 range, this is way too high for that. So it's going to be a metabolic alkalosis. Okay, 
So remember what the normal HCO3 is. It's 22 to 26, 30 is too high. Metabolic alkalosis. Step, oh, and I've circled that there. Step two, what needs to happen? Well, if you have a metabolic alkalosis, you need to have a respiratory sort of change. And if it needs to be a respiratory change, since we've got way too much HCO3, we're gonna to need to also increase CO2 to compensate for that. So in other words, the change we need is an increase in CO2. Let's apply a formula. Now have a think, what formula are we gonna use? Well, we have a patient with metabolic alkalosis, so why not use that formula? So for the metabolic alkalosis, if you go back to the main slide with the formulas on it, we know it's 0 0.7 times 30 plus 20, which is equal to 41, but we also have a leeway of plus or minus five. So in other words, if it's anywhere between 36 and 46, we know that this patient has compensated. Let's have a look at their actual PCO2. It's actually just 30. We wanted it to increase, right? So they're at 30. We need to be at least 36 to 44. So they're not quite there yet, which means they're not adequately compensated. Now, either that is because we just need to give them a bit more time, their body will be able to do the trick itself, or because their body is so overwhelmed, the severe vomiting, something's wrong, they're just not gonna be able to reach there. And we need to provide some sort of support to them. That's probably what's gonna happen if they present in an acute setting. Okay, but this gives us an indication, is their body still trying to fight it or is it just gonna sit back there and we're gonna to need to do some support um, for that extra information? Okay, hope that makes sense. And we'll be going over a lot of more questions like this when we get to the um, Kahoot quizzes that we do in a couple of weeks time. But for now, if you understand these two cases, that's a very, very good start. And I'd highly recommend you look back at the slide with the formulas, keep that as a resource in front of you as you do any questions, whether it's in a workshop or a lecture. Um, and try and commit it to memory as best as you can in an easy way for yourself. A couple of other random, really low yield things, but still cool to know, is on the, the left-hand side, we've got this diagram that kind of, uh, I think it's called a nomogram or something like that, but it's basically a graph that tells us whether a patient has an isolated problem, or whether it's actually a mixed metabolic um, and respiratory disorder. So sometimes if you've got, say for example, metabolic acidosis, and respiratory alkalosis happening at the same time, they might actually, because it's one is alkalotic, one is acidotic, they can actually cancel each other out. So the patient's pH might look fine, but they still look horrible. And so you're automatically thinking, wait, it doesn't make sense. They may be, maybe it's not that they've actually compensated or anything. It might just be because there are two really bad things happening at the same time, canceling each other out. Obviously on the other side of the spectrum, you could have metabolic acidosis, respiratory acidosis, both happening at the same time. So they're really, really acidotic, and you're wondering what the hell is happening, this doesn't make sense, you need to look at the nomogram to figure out the reasoning. So the way that you read this, and you're never gonna need to do this ever, ever, ever in an exam, I hope, but, and I say I hope, and just watch as this is a question on an exam, um, I hope not. Basically, you look at the pH, you map it across with HCO3, you map it across with H+, if your dot, wherever it is, ends up within this flower, cauliflower-shaped thing, then it's actually just an isolated independent problem. So if it ends up in this branch, it's just metabolic alkalosis. If it ends up in this bottom branch, it's metabolic acidosis, et cetera. If it ends up outside of this cauliflower, that means it's a mixed problem. It's not really that helpful because it doesn't tell you what type of mixed problem it is, but it tells you that this person needs urgent help because it's not just one problem that we need to fix, it's multiple things. The other diagram on the right is just something that came up in a workshop and it confused the heck out of a lot of people, including myself, but once you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. So let's say a person is in alkalosis. Uh, essentially, what we're trying to do here is trying to figure out if they're in alkalosis or acidosis, how does that change the potassium levels? Because we know potassium is a very, very important ion. If you've got differences, if it's too high, too low, it can have a lot of effects, including mainly your heart, right? It's not going to be able to pump effectively. So alkalosis, what essentially happens is, so if you read the sentence here, in as a compensation for alkalosis, we need to try and increase the acidity of the ECF, right? Because it's really alkalotic right now. So what we do is we move the HCO3 into the cells away from the ECF. We, we shunt a lot of H plus out, which is acidic. So it's gonna balance out the alkalosis. But because now we've got this change in electric uh, potential, we've moved a lot of negative stuff inside, a lot of positive stuff outside. We also need to balance that out by moving some positive stuff back in. Of course, we don't want to move the H plus back in, right? That defeats the, per the point of having H plus there. So we instead use another ion, which we know there's, a, there's a, a bit of on the outside, which is K plus. However, because you're moving K plus into the cells away from the ECF, we now have a hypokalemic patient, hypokalemic ECF. In a similar way, if you're acidotic, 
then your body compensates by moving HCO3 out of the cells so it can balance out that acidosis in the ECF. And as a compensation, it brings H plus back into the cells. Again, however, you've got too much negative outside, way too much positive inside. So K plus, uh, another thing your body does is move K plus away from the cells to sort of balance that out. But now you've got a really like a huge amount of K plus in the ECF and that's hyperkalemia. So essentially what this is trying to get at is, yes, while some of these compensation mechanisms are really good and we want compensation to happen in a patient, sometimes they can have um, other chronic effects and we need to look out for the other ions, not so much just Na. CL and the other things we talked about in the previous slides. Awesome. So that's it for uh, acid-based compensation, acid-based mechanisms, acid-based balance. Hopefully this covers every bit of content that you would cover in a workshop or a lesson. The main things are just going to be the formulas that we covered. So if you just want to print out maybe like this slide and this slide, just print them out, have them somewhere, stick it up on a um, whiteboard or a wall somewhere. And try and commit it to memory because you are going to be using this so much. There's going to be uh, at least you know two or three exam questions just on this purely. So it's really important that you remember it. All right. Best of luck for your studies, as always. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to myself or anyone else in the team who's done the particular topic. And as always, again, if there's any mistakes or things that you just find super confusing and I've explained it really badly, which does happen sometimes, just let me know and I'm happy to create another set of resources for you to have a look at. Best of luck, and I'll see you in another PS Platypus lecture. Bye-bye.